Good afternoon, ladies and gents, and thanks for turning up. I was told that if we did the last session, we'd just be seeing a sea of empty seats. So I uh, appreciate you turning up and hanging about. So today we're going to be talking about how a processor makes a connection from a carcass to a product which we wish to sell. So we're looking at the, the Roller B Campbell, the current utility carcass and how we turn that into a bigger carcass over time, maximising carcass yields and the customer. So I suppose our business, we're 100% Australian family owned and operated. Uh, we've been going for just about 50 years now, so uh, we're continuing to go strong here, you know, amongst a lot of competition. Uh, we have two sites in Sydney, so we employ around 600 people all up across the sites. We source pigs from independent Australian pig producers and uh, we get pigs from all over the eastern states of Australia. And I suppose we connect our producers with the end users and the markets and you know, we, we see our role you know, to market the pork across all channels. So look, this, this is just a picture of our boning room here. So uh, this is an SFK inline boning system. You'll see uh, the pigs being laid down there on the line. We split them into leg, middle and shoulder. And then that goes down six boning lines. And this is sort of an aerial shot of our boning room. So look, you'd see there's a lot of people there. Uh, boning out pigs is a very labour intensive job. Even with all the great technology from Europe, um, you know, we still need a lot of people in the boning room. So, you know, as time and technology improves, um, you know, we still see that we're going to need the people. And, you know, in Australia at the moment, we're, you know, blessed with full employment. So I suppose, like all of us, you know, we're very challenged there that we've got to, you know, continue to try and work through these difficult labour conditions. This next slide here, so... Here's some of our mints being pushed down the line at our tray packing facility at Arndell Park. Uh, so this line here, it's going to a Mondini machine and uh, we're doing about 100 packs per minute through here of the little, the little mints packets. That next one there, that's a, a tray dispensing machine and carton dispensing machine. So we have 10 lines in the plant. And what we do, each of those lines, the product runs down and at the end of the line we put it into a, a retail ready box. So that box there is ready to go out onto the shelf at the supermarket. In, what you can't see there is a, there's a mezzanine level uh, where we do the machine erection of these uh, cartons and crates and they are fed down onto the line. Yeah, so look, this is a pretty simple one here. So we... We buy pigs, uh, process them and sell them into a, a series of markets. Uh, these markets here are all, um, you know, in the floating market. So, you know, it's a supply and demand type arrangement where we don't have any contracted prices. Uh, we have a small portion of the business there that's within the supermarket channel and that's contracted business. So outside of supermarkets, you're really in the supply and demand market. So looking at you know, the carcass utility, current carcass, which is the utility carcass and moving towards a heavier carcass. So look, at, we, both, we all know that producers benefit from heavier carcasses and so do uh, processors as well. So we get greater efficiencies by putting bigger pigs through the boning room. Just like on farm producing pigs, you know, you're going to get better... Uh, efficiencies through producing bigger pigs, better cost of production. So I suppose, you know, we, we all want to produce bigger pigs and process bigger pigs, but it's what the market demands which really drives it. So, you know, what does the customer want? So look, we believe that's an 80 kilo carcass is what we call, you know, our utility carcass, which is, you know, fit for most markets. What you'll find is at the moment out there at the retail level, there's a lot of product that still remains rind on. So it means, you know, we're selling the cuts of meat with the skin and the fat still left on. So that's very good for yield. And, you know, that's a, a big factor that comes into this is yield. We've also got the fact that, um, you know, this carcass fits into most channels. So we'll have maximum size limits on various parts of the pig you can see their legs, middles and shoulders. If you look at that, there's some different cuts there that, you know, if we produce over that size, the customers simply don't want that product. So th this is, 
this utility carcass fits within those boundaries. You know, what can we do about raising carcass weights and how are we going to go about trying to grow a bigger carcass? So look, we're currently working with uh, one of the major supermarkets on some new cutting lines. So that means, I suppose, you know, lifting carcass weights and trying to grow the pig bigger and get more out of a bigger pig. So look, it's something we've been working on for a few years with the supermarkets and we've probably been fortunate that we've been able to lift the weights about 10 kilos you know, in the last five years up until now. So, you know, we're on the right path, but we've still got a little bit further to go. And we feel like, you know, these new cutting lines will be, you know, sufficient for the market and we'll still be able to produce a quality product. Uh, look, as part of this, we're really going to have to consider more rindless product because obviously as you get grow a bigger pig, you know, you're going to have, uh, you know, more fat. So it's just something to consider. What happens then? We've got to derind that product and then you sort of, got a, a product that's in direct competition, you know, in terms of look and feel as the imported product. Now, whilst we can't import, you know, uh, overseas meat at the moment fresh, uh, if our products here change and become more like theirs, there'll certainly be a push on by overseas people to try and get the meat into Australia. So it's just a, a consideration. And look, the other one is you're going to have um, bigger pigs, a lot of big bones. So at the moment we do a lot of bone in product. Um, you know, bones off a, off a big pig are going to look pretty ugly in the retail pack. So we'd be looking at a lot more boneless product, which again is, is less yield. And probably one of our biggest issues is at Christmas time, we've got to try and solve the, uh, the ham issue. So, you know, at the moment, um, you know, we've got hams that are, are the right size. What we'd be looking at is doing a chump off ham, um, you know, which is basically just trying to get the right size that's convenient for the customer and also the right price point. maximising carcass return. So look, when processing a carcass into a finished product, we aim to do so in a way that maximises our return whilst meeting the customer needs. Um, you know, we do this in a number of ways, improving the cutting lines. So that means, you know, constantly refining the way we cut the pig up. Ongoing yield analysis. So we're always looking at our yields, trying to improve them and, and do a better job there. And uh, we're monitoring this daily and also uh, live data analysis. So what we're doing there is, is feeding that data out live and getting the information out to the, the line supervisors so they're monitoring yield. So what we're doing there is, um, you know, the line supervisors are not doing any boning, they're off the line, so they're focusing on yield all the way through and watching the people on the belt. So as soon as they see something that's not right, they get into the guys and make sure that they're getting back to their right cutting lines. We're also doing benchmarking with a lot of uh, overseas processes or, or a group of superior processes so um, we're keeping abreast there and making sure that we're at least competing with their yields or, or if not bettering them and also utilising the carcass is, is the byproducts you know um, everything that we do is export accredited so we've got to have that um, well our pigs being killed in an export abattoir so we can get all those byproducts off into Asia and you know get the best value out of the carcass. So look, this here is just a picture of a pig being cut up um, and some of the cuts that come off the pig and, and the various markets that they go into. So look, I suppose, just to put it simply, we're trying to sell a uh, well fresh meat all the time off the pig and we're going to sell as much fresh meat as possible and we only really sell frozen meat when we've got too much of it or we've got a specific customer order for frozen. So you've got to understand... You know, when you get into the frozen meat market, you're going to take a hit straight away. So we're always trying to sell uh, more fresh meat. So that's it's pretty simple, but that's basically the concept. So you know, throughout different times of the year, you won't always have the opportunity to to sell the meat fresh. So you've got to put it away and store it. Now this one here, this is our our yield tree. Um, you probably can't see the numbers there for for good reason, secret yield um, information, but. I suppose the point of this is, um, you know, we cut all our pigs up differently by grade and each grade you've got different ways you can cut the pig up. So what we do every single scenario and way that you can cut up a pig, we've got our expected yields there. So each day what we do is track, you know, our actual yields versus our planned and make sure that we're on track. So, you know, any deviation from this we're meeting in the daily meetings and we're trying to work out why we didn't meet our yield targets. And look, I suppose most importantly, 
you know, when trying to work out how to turn a carcass into a product is the customer. So, you know, we're aiming to produce products that, you know, have the specs to fulfil the customer needs. And we do this by looking at quality, price, consistency, taste, um, you know, not necessarily in that order. It's going to depend which market you're going into as to which, you know, priority the customer needs those different attributes. So we serve a full range of markets and that's where we see one of our strengths is that, you know, we're going into all markets. Talking about the food service customer. So uh, this is probably where the business started 50 years ago with uh, Ted's father, Bruce. And demand here is mainly for the, the rindless products. So products like bellies, necks, shoulders. So look, we've got a bit more flexibility here on carcass weight so we can go with a heavier carcass here and we don't run into any problems. But look, this market's ex extremely price sensitive. So what happens here is, you know, we're getting feedback in the market every day from our salespeople. And you know, if you're, if you're 10 cents out, uh, you may need to move your price to keep the market. So, you know, we get we get all the feedback. We're we're living it and breathing it every day. So, you know, in some cases we might ask to see some evidence of a docket or something like that to make sure. And and we don't necessarily want to be the cheapest, but you know, we might might need to move halfway to keep our market share. So, yeah, a very price sensitive market. Um, you know, it accounts for a small percentage of our total sales. But uh, our product branding here is done by our blue and white lid. So all the Asian customers know when they see that blue and white lid, it's a BEC lid, and also the, the service reliability that comes with that. So, you know, we've developed strong relationships over, over the 40 years that the customers know that, you know, whatever they order, they can get. Okay, distributor customers. So these are customers that serve pubs and clubs. So very strong competition here amongst distributor customers. You know, there's a lot of uh, promotional activity and rebates, so it's, it's a very competitive market. Um, tend to demand smaller cuts and leaner products. Um, you know, also price sensitive as well. Um, these customers have end users that are, um, they're costing out down to the portion size. So this might be like a, a nursing home or a hospital and they've got to try and put a meal on the table for a certain price. So it's also very price sensitive, as you can imagine. Um, you know, the imported ribs have cannibalised that market, imported ribs and bellies, as we saw a couple of years ago. Um, you know, now that the pig price and the meat price has come down a bit, we're back in there competing again. However, I suppose we just don't want to be complacent there. We've always got to keep an eye on what those imported prices are doing and making sure that we're competitive with them. Because, uh, yeah, the end users are going to get creative and if they can buy it cheaper, they will. So we've also seen a lot of value added emerging in this market. Um, individual portion, vacuum pack. Vacuum pack, you're going to get the additional shelf life and uh, even cook product as well to make it easier for the chefs uh, so they don't have to employ such skilled chefs at some of these places. Once again, you know, strong customer service level, um, strong relationships, meat quality, consistency, all very important with this type of customer. Manufacturing customers, so that's the, the small goods market, you know, ham, salami, etc. A lot of Danish middles used here, you know, so we're, we're constantly competing with the imported product, as you all know. You know, they've got, you know, pigs slightly bigger than ours, but, you know, they do quite a lean carcass and a quite a consistent carcass, so it's a good product. Um, we've got difficulty selling our, our bigger ham trim legs, you know, because we're um, get once again governed by the size of the, the leg, so something we can work on in the future. And, you know, during the winter months, you've got to remember as well that there's not a constant demand for pork. So what we've got to do is put some of that meat away in the freezer or we've got to get it into processing or, or offshore. So that's what we've just got to remember is in the summer months, there's a lot of barbecues and a lot of, a lot of middle meat goes out the door pretty quickly. Come the winter months, you know, you start to have less barbecues, it slows down. And then you've really got to try and, you know, keep that meat moving so it ends up going into processing. There's also a, a huge opportunity. We've got uh, cool labelling coming in or, or country of origin labelling. So um, we see that as a real big opportunity that, that, you know, the APL and all of us can, can lobby the major small goods manufacturers and the retailers that we can get a section on the shelf in the supermarket with a um, Australian branded small goods. So, you know, that, that would be a big you know, when if we could get that space.
Yeah, so we've got the retail butchers. We've got, in, in Sydney, we've got, you know, an, an Asian-style butcher or a Western-style butcher. Uh, the Asian-style butchers prefer a big lean pig and the Western's a, a smaller lean pig, both, both female pigs. Uh, you know, the Western butchers prefer a, a smaller carcass that they can do more value-added sweet cuts with. Um, and the Asians, it's more about pumping out the volume and, and something that's more a commodity thing at a, at a price. So what we've found there as well is we've been successful in um, sending some of our branded Brumar product into the Western butchers. So uh, they're quite happy to take some of that branded meat uh, moisture infused into their product range. What we've also got to understand is, you know, um, as the market dynamics change, the butchers are, you know, struggling to compete with the supermarkets. So I think it's just recently that uh, Woolies and Coles are now over 50% of the Australian fresh meat market. So, um, you know, it's going to be hard for the Western and Asian butchers to compete going forward, but it's just a, a trend that we see emerging. Export byproducts, um, obviously, once again, you know, we're competing on the world stage there against the big processes with, with pretty serious efficiencies. Um, we don't compete at all over there selling our prime cuts, so it's really just the, uh, the byproducts that we can sell over there. So, uh, yeah, we're very limited in that market, but look, it's still a very good market to move byproducts and to get value out of the pig. Um, you know, we also, at times when there's you know, serious oversupplies such as at the moment. What we're doing is um, sending a lot of meat offshore, packed, um, just to get it out of Australia. So uh, we're doing that currently for, you know, a portion of our own meat and even for some other packers. Um, we're also sending meat offshore just to get it out of Australia. So it's a very good release valve when we have an oversupply situation. Look, we also do a little bit of work. This is more a niche market into... Uh, you know, supermarkets overseas. This is for the, you know, the affluent consumer and they're looking for higher quality. So when they think of the Australian pork, they think of, um, you know, food safety, consistency, quality. So, look, we're making some inroads there, but at the moment it's, it's a very small market, but it's an emerging market and, you know, there's, there's opportunity for growth in the future. So we've got some of our branded product there on shelf overseas. And look, this is our biggest market, which is our Australian supermarket. So, consumer. So, look, at the moment, the, the trends would be that we're looking for smaller package, um, easy to cook, healthy. Um, we're shifting away from the bigger roasting pieces as people are time poor and they're looking for something small that they can um, get easily and, and cook without too much effort. We've got fierce competition with all the other proteins. So, um, we've been fortunate that... Beef and lamb prices have been, you know, pretty high in the last couple of years. So what we've seen is pork has been able to capitalise on that and grow the shelf space, which is great. Um, and look, chicken's probably been the best. Uh, they've grown the most in the last couple of years. But I suppose the point we want to make here is um, whilst making these good inroads, uh, we don't want to be complacent at all and we want to make sure we maintain that shelf space. So it's just one to, to be mindful of. If beef prices come down, you know, we, we will be under more threat from the beef side of things, but, you know, let's try and maintain that market share. Strict specifications. Look, the, the modern consumer is really after a very lean piece of meat, so the pigs that we're putting into this market are sort of 10 mil and under carcass, so it's a, it's a very lean carcass. And we're doing constant analysis on all of our different products in the store to see that how we're selling them, um, whether we're getting any markdowns and whether we need to do any product reformulation to improve the products that we've got out there. Another way we connect with our customers is via branding. So uh, the Brumar brand here that you see, we aim for our consumers to identify with the brand and develop an attachment to the brand. Um, you can see here that, the, that that's a product there in a retail sleeve and we've got a brand story with a link back to the producers. Uh, Pre-marinated, easy to cook, um, you know, consistency here is very important. So we want to have a product that when a consumer uh, goes to the market, they know they're going to get the same product every time. And that way, with a premium product, you know, that they want to know they get that consistency, whether it's in, uh, you know, juiciness, tenderness and taste, that every time they go, they get the same product. Probably the, the big one here to note is uh, promotional activity. Uh, we spent an enormous amount of money promoting the product. So look, for this brand, uh, with one of the majors, we're spending about $20,000 a week on promotions. 
So that's uh, a vendor funded or, or self funded promotion. So we're paying for those promos and uh, taking the discount on the product. You know, we're, we're also connecting via Carcass Innovation. So, you know, we're, we're looking at producing leaner value cuts of pork, um, smaller portion sizes, utilising more of the carcass. Um, there's some big opportunities with some value added lines. Uh, we're doing some schnitzel and some kebabs, which are working out pretty well sort of comparable to what the chicken people do. Um, you could even, you know, crumb them and marinate them and, and put them in rubs, which works really well. And, uh, you know, we're even doing a pre-cooked product as well. So, you know, it's, it's our own Australian pork, but we, we cook it and have it ready to heat from the supermarket shelf. We're really always looking to the market to, you know, when you're, you're talking about your customer and your consumer, you're looking to leverage off the insights. Um, you know, look at all the local trends. We get a lot of data from overseas that tell us, you know, what's happening over in Europe and the States. So we can constantly maintain, you know, a grip on what the market's doing and what the consumer wants. Um, technical advancements in packaging is another big one. So, you know, you would have seen that evolve a lot over time. The, the packs are getting smaller and we're doing a lot of skin pack which is great for uh, shelf life, so the product's lasting longer on the shelf. This is just a bit of a, a, a process line of our innovation process here from, from concept right through to managing a, a finished good at the store level. So look, you can see there's quite a number of steps there. And uh, you know, you've got to put a lot of investment in this. So we've got about um, a team of about 10 staff working on new product development. So they're working on all stages from um, concept right through to managing finished products in the market. So um, you can see it's quite a long timeline there, three months to two years, um, you know, based on the complexity of the innovation. So, yeah, we've got a few in the pipeline that have taken us, you know, a very long time to come to market. But, you know, this is where you need to be if you want to be first to market. So you've got to keep, you know, innovating and improving and getting better each time. So I suppose in, in conclusion... Um, you know, some good news. Australian pork consumption is growing um, and, and our supermarket shelf space is too, so that's a very good story. But, uh, you know, what we want to do is continue to maintain that shelf space and, uh, you know, grow our share of the market against the other proteins. Potential export opportunities to China, well, you know, that's only in its infancy and obviously we've got to get the protocols in place and there's a fair bit to go on there, but, you know, another big opportunity for us with a clean green image and product that we've got. So a lot of potential there. Innovation and technology to bring down our supply chain costs. So I suppose we've all got to think about how we can, you know, as producers and processors, bring down our costs. Um, you know, we're, we've got a fair way to go, I suppose, to compete with the, the really, you know, good people like the Europeans and, uh, you know, in scale with the Americans. So, you know, we've all got to take, you know, this stuff away and, and think about it and say, well, how can we get better and do a better job and bring down our costs. So, you know, always looking at uh, continuous improvement. And probably, you know, most importantly at the moment, in terms of where we're at in, in, in the market, is, you know, really working together, producers and processors. Um, we've got some very hard times ahead, and uh, we've probably never seen the market as bad as what we've seen at this time around. So, you know, Ted's not here today, but he certainly said it's the worst he's seen it in about 30 years. So... Look, I think that's where we've really got to get together and say, how can we, you know, cut all of our costs and, and do things as efficiently as possible and, and work together. So, you know, with, if, if you're a producer with your various processes, you may want to think about, you know, sharing some of the losses now and then, you know, in the better times, um, sharing some of the wins. But, you know, it's about sort of sticking together and trying to get through this. So, yeah. All right. Thanks, guys. Just... Thanks, Nathan, for that presentation. Um, does anyone have any questions for Nathan? We might do questions now. I have a question. Um, yes. You mentioned benchmarking B Campbell to um, processes overseas. Yep. What do you see as the biggest challenges in, in the near future? Look, I'd say probably, um, you know, w w with us there, it's just... Um, carcass quality is, is one for us, I'd say, you know, in, in the processing plant, um, you know, they've got very consistent carcasses overseas, um, so getting that, that consistency in the carcass. 
Um, look, we, we could probably do some work on some of our equipment. You know, we've got a plant that's, um, you know, our, our boning site is, is ageing, so there's a little bit of work we can do there uh, to get a little bit more automation in. Um, so when, when the time's right, we'll, we'll try and do that. But I'd say it's, yeah, you know, a little bit more automation and then um, getting the consistent carcass through. Another one that, that's going to be hard to compete with, um, you know, is, is labour costs here that, that affects all of us. So, you know, whether it be on the farm or... Um, in the processing hall, uh, labour costs are extremely high in Australia, and yeah, with our with our very full employment, um, and we're a very isolated market here. I, I see that as being another challenge. Yeah. Hi, Deb Kerr from Australian Pork. Uh, thanks for the, I'm up up the back here. Um, thanks for that overview. It's uh, pretty informative. My question probably relates to your export market focus and. Perhaps if I could make a comment and get your response. When we're exporting to countries, it doesn't matter what product it is, usually those countries like, you know, long lanes of continuous product. But if we are looking at, you know, the excess from the domestic market, that probably doesn't gender with what export markets want. And I know that you talked about byproducts in particular are, you know, are, are quite a, a good outcome for export markets from our perspective. But I'm just wondering if you could comment on, you know, importing countries who want those long lines of continuously good products that are consistent in quality. Yeah, Deb. Uh, look, I, I suppose that's a hard one. You know, if we're if we're talking about uh, prime cuts, you know, we're just not competitive on on a world stage. So you know, we're we're not competing with some of those other countries from a, pi a price point. Uh, the byproducts market. You know, we're, we're very much a price taker there and we'll take, you know, wh whatever the market's doing on the day. So, at the moment, there's a bit of an oversupply of pork across the world. Um, so, you'd say that byproducts market in Asia is very saturated, so we're seeing low prices. Um, some of the retail work that we're doing up in Asia, which is, you know, the value-added supermarket type work, um, you know, it's a, it's a very niche market and there's very limited volume that, um, you know, you can fit into those markets now. That may all change if, you know, we get the protocols with China and, and China opens up. However, look, we're still competing against other countries, um, you know, who, who have good pork processing systems. Um, so there's a lot of different um, either, either UK or, or European companies that are, that are doing pretty well over in some of those Asian countries that we're competing against. Um, so, look, do, do we see ourselves competing long term for primals? Uh, Probably not at this stage unless we could bring our cost of production down and, and be competitive there. So we're thinking more, you know, byproducts and niche markets and, and hope for those niche markets develop into, you know, higher volumes in the future. Um, yeah, thanks, Nathan. There's three things that I just think about as a producer. Uh, one is the supply chain cost with trucks running across Australia, vast distances and, and trucks running up and down the Hume Highway, one way empty, one way etc. It's the cost of, of our product shifting around the country. The other one was uh, you haven't mentioned infusion with any prospects of of that as an added value and perhaps get it into the pricing point. Yep. And the third one, if we're focusing on 80 kilo carcasses, is there a case for us to scan as producers those pigs that are not going to meet specification before they go to market and put them down the line as a line that would be uh, would pull the skin off and perhaps head down a line that might be uh, have a higher fat content in the in the in the eye or wherever in the meat, and we take it into a market where we can drive a higher price than this uh, low price we're getting for that particular pig. Yeah, thanks, Neil. So look, I suppose on the first one with the the transportation costs and the the limited abattoir kill space across Australia, um, you know, we would say definitely at the moment, um, you know, that there's a an undercapacity of, of kill and bone space across Australia. So, um, you know, especially in, in New South Wales, we see that, um, you know, there's no open export accredited abattoir in, in New South Wales. So, yes, look, we, we do see that a, as an issue. Um, so that's, that's an opportunity, I suppose, for the future. Um, and definitely, you know, you, you, you don't want those pigs travelling too far on the trucks. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, in terms of, you know, moisture infused products, um, you know, we're doing a lot of moisture infused products now, um, so that market, you know, is, is going well. 
Um, you know, it's a, it's a value-added product, so there's there's more weight. Um, you know, it's it's juicy and tender, so it, it eats really well. And our Brumar brand um, is all moisture infused. So yeah, I, I see a, a big future for for moisture infused product. And uh, yeah, look, in terms of those carcasses that don't quite meet the spec, so, so we do that currently now. So what, what we do when, when we get the pigs in, we grade them out into the various grades, and any pigs that are lean, that, that meet the weight and fat requirements, and, and gender and, and gestation status and so on, you know, we put them down a certain line to go into certain production orders, and any of those uh, fatter carcasses are going down a separate uh, boning run, so we sort them out when they come to the plant. And, and basically, that's exactly what we do. Any of the, the, the really fat pigs, we, we go rind off, and they go into some of those markets that are, that are less sensitive to, uh, you know, rind on product, the, the markets that demand a rindless product. So, yeah, we, we, we're currently doing that now. But I suppose when we talk about the, the larger carcass, what we're saying is, is there opportunity, um, you know, to change the retailer and what we see on the shelves to seeing more boneless and rindless product there which would allow us to grow a heavier carcass. So it'll be an opportunity to change the, the specs that we're seeing out there at the retail level at a, at a bigger scale. So uh, allow us to grow a bigger proportion of, of larger animals. Yep. Oh, one more. No, no, I don't, I don't think we're gonna to get to that point. Um, Look, unfortunately at the moment to how the markets work, um, whenever there's an oversupply, um, you know, it drags the whole market down. So what we're seeing is, you know, we're only oversupplied by a few thousand pigs per week, but those extra pigs that we're seeing every week are out there in the market every single week. So what we're seeing is prices continuing to come down. So um, probably one thing that we want to make clear, you know, we, we sometimes hear comments as a processor this is a great time for us when, you know, pigs are really cheap because we're making a lot of money. So um, that's certainly not the case. Uh, what we like is when there's a really tight market and, you know, the, the pig price is higher and there's, there's not this oversupply situation because what it means then is if, if the market's a little bit short, we can then try and sell our meat for more. So, look, ideally for us, if the demand for, for Aussie meat, you know, is 100,000 pigs per week, you know, if supply was at 99,000 pigs per week, that'd be just about perfect. Um, so, yeah, look, un un unfortunately there, what's going to happen is until the supply starts to drop down and go below the demand, um, you know, it's going to continue to be in this very tough cycle. So that's what, what's really going to happen is when that supply dips down, that's when we're going to start to see that, that market really tighten up. So in, in, in terms of, you know, dis displacement of the imported product, uh, that product's coming in and has been for a long time, um, so I don't think we're going to stop that. What we've really got to try and do, but is, is you know, lobby with those small goods processors. You know, can they have a, an Australian branded product on the supermarket shelves? And 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 you know, the big guys, Coles and Woolies, the same story. Can they you know support that? So you know, it gives the uh, the customer, I suppose, the option they can go and buy the cheap imported small goods, or they can buy the better you know Australian quality small goods. You know, sitting next to it. Uh, yeah, up the back. Just additional follow-up question on the carcass weight. When you compare the strategy of exporting byproducts to China versus having heavier carcass weights, which do you believe will bring the greatest value to the Australian pork industry? Oh, I think the heavier carcass weights for sure. A a absolutely. You know, if we could you know, lift those carcass weights, you know, five or ten kilos on an average, um, that would have a, a significant impact for, for producers. You know, as, as a processor, um, you know, we'd, we'd love a bigger pig coming through the room. Yes, whilst we've got some issues with the yield, um, you know, a lot of that, uh, you, know, you know, the bone and the rind and the fat goes, so we, we, we lose out a bit there. Um, you know, that, we'd, that would be a big win if we could get those carcass weights up. Thank you for that, Nathan. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we've all talked about uh, how we wish we'd started uh, getting uh, wheels in motion to get access to China sooner. Um, but now the, the, the wheels really are in motion. And I want to 
talk to you just for two minutes about uh, how that works. So there are government-to-government -government, uh, uh, discussions that go on which actually allow protocols and e exports to happen. But inside China, because they've got a very long uh, history of uh, culture, there are a number of, of non-government agencies that have quite a lot of influence in actually getting the governments to agree that we can export. Um, one of those uh, uh, influential organizations is called the China Cuisine Association. And we're very lucky today to have uh, Mr. Bian, who's the Vice President of the China Cuisine Association, here to talk to us. Please bear with, bear, bear with us, because it will, obviously he's going to speak in Chinese, so there will be uh, a translation. Um, but just to put the current glut in some form of context, if we could move China to, uh, to consume Australian pork for four hours, we would no longer have this oversupply. So 240 minutes, problem solved. So Mr. Bian, welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm very grateful for Australian Pork Limited's invitation for me to attend the Pan Pacific Pork Expo. This is one of the activities that was listed in the MOU of cooperation signed between our two associations in 2016. I'm very happy that I can share with the experts gathered here today some key aspects of the China food and beverage market and the opportunities for Australian pork. Today I'm going to introduce a few aspects of the China's food and beverage market consumption. First of all, I'll give an introduction to the overall consumption characteristics. Uh in, in 2017, China's food and beverage revenue was estimated at 3.96 trillion RMB, which is around 823 billion Australian dollars. This represents growth of 10.7% over 2016. Uh, Recently, the CCA and China Central Television jointly published the 2017 Annual Food Consumption Report. Uh, Together,我们国家权威的互联网机构提供了大数据,我们对2017年中国餐饮消费热点进行梳理,并对2018年餐饮消费趋势做出了预判。in this, we analyze internet big data sources to identify key 2017 food and beverage consumption points and then to forecast trends for 2018. And now I'll give the, an introduction to the seven qualities defining the food and beverage market in China over that time. The first is that the pursuit of high quality experience continues to grow. The second characteristic is the popularity of the salty taste. Salty flavor is the most popular. The 
the food and beverage industry is trending towards more diversity with fastest growth in the casual dining sector. The fourth characteristic is that the demands of younger consumers are becoming more personalized and more diverse. The fifth characteristic is a strong demand for online purchases, delivery services, and booking services. The sixth characteristic is that consumers are relying more and more on opinions that they find on third-party internet social platforms. The seventh characteristic is that mobile payment application use is becoming more and more normalized. Now I'll introduce some of the main characteristics and trends for 2018. The first trend is that the younger demographics have become the main engine of consumption. And there is increased attention to nutrition and health, which is the second characteristic. The Next, I will introduce some of the, uh, the third aspect will be, sorry, the development and direction of China's food and beverage market. Since the beginning of the reform and opening up period, 40 years ago, China's food and beverage market has experienced rapid development and from 2007 onwards has surpassed the 1 trillion RMB per year mark. Uh, In 2018, food and beverage industry continues to demonstrate stable growth. In 2017, there were 4.65 million food and beverage enterprises in China. And the number of individual outlets exceeded 8 million, surpassing the American food and beverage market to become the largest in the world. In the last year, the the market is huge, nearly 40% or about 1.6 trillion out of the total 4 trillion turnover of the food and beverage market consists of purchases of raw materials and of kitchen and processing equipment. And pork is the most basic ingredient of Chinese cooking. Its usage is wide, wide, and the volume is large. And now we'll introduce the function and membership structure of the China Cuisine Association. The China Cuisine Association is the only organization in the country that is the only the China Cuisine Association is the only food and beverage industry organization registered by the Chinese government. Due to the 
各级组织网络，来将政府的管理职能转化于服务职服务职能。Prior to the economic reforms, the association was part of the government's business department, and so even after becoming an independent social organization, the CCA retained its original complete structure at all levels across China in provinces, cities, districts, and counties. And this has helped to facilitate the conversion from a government management function to one that provides a direct service. 呃，作为政府背景的行业组织，它的职能包括行业组织、行业自律、资源整合、企业维权、商业协调、国际交流、人才培训等方面的工作，为社会、政府、会员和企业服务，促进行业的积极进步与发展。The responsibilities of the association include industry organization, industry self-regulation, resource integration, enterprise rights protection, business coordination, international exchanges, staff training and related work, and to serve the society, government, members and enterprises, and to promote positive progress and development of the industry. In recent years, the International Trade Association, the International Trade Union, the International Trade Union, the International Trade Union, 年度中国餐饮百强的公布，注册中国烹饪大师的认定，中国烹饪大师传承名人堂，中国美食名城认定等等活动，已经成为中国餐饮行业最具知名度与影响力的盛会与盛事。In recent years, the association has organized the International Food and Beverage Expo. The China Chefs Festival, the Chinese Catering Industry Development Conference, the annual announcement of the top 100 Chinese catering enterprises, the certification of Chinese Culinary Masters, the Chinese Culinary Masters Hall of Fame, and the appointment of Chinese food cities, etc. These activities are very well known and influential in the food industry in China and recognized as significant events. The Chinese Culinary Masters Hall of Fame has a number of employees in the Chinese Culinary Masters. 有清真、快餐、团餐、正餐、休闲餐、国际餐、素食、冷菜、服务、供应链等细化的业态分支组织三十多个。The China Cuisine Association currently has more than 70 employees with expertise in halal, fast food, group meals, dinner, casual meals, international food, vegetarian food, cold food, service and supply chain, etc. in nearly 30 branch organizations. 在中国，各省市县的烹饪餐饮组织都是中国烹饪协会的团体会员，全国大型餐饮企业也都是中国烹饪协会的会员。目前，中国烹饪协会直接团体会员将近三千个，个人会员超过十万人。In China, the food and beverage industry organizations in all provinces, cities, and counties. As well as the large national catering enterprises, are members of the Chinese Cuisine Association. Currently, the association has around 3,000 direct members and more than 100,000 individual members. 通过遍布全国的行业组织，中国烹饪协会的工工作范围覆盖了全国八百多万家餐馆。Through various industry organizations across the country, the association covers more than eight million restaurants. 目前，协会领导层包括一位会长、四位专职副会长、三十三位兼职副会长，这些都囊括了全国不同地区最具实力及影响力的餐饮组织及大型餐饮企业的领导人。At present, the leadership of the association includes the president, four full-time vice presidents, and thirty-three part-time vice presidents plus more. These include leaders of the most promising and influential food and beverage organizations and large catering enterprises in different parts of the country. I will share with you the fourth issue, which is the value of the beef in Chinese culture and history. And the fourth main topic I'd like to cover today is the value of pork in Chinese cooking culture and history. According to Chinese history records, since about 2,000 years ago, in the Qing Dynasty. According to historical records, around 2,000 years ago, during the Qin Dynasty, which occurred in the second century BC, there were six principal domesticated animals. So, six 呢
，包括马、牛、羊、猪、狗、鸡，其中牛、羊、猪又居于特别重要的位置。These six animals were the horse, the cow, the sheep, the pig, the dog, and the chicken. Of these, cattle, sheep, and pigs played an important role. 在中国宋朝。有一位著名的诗人叫苏东坡，他发明了小火慢炖、方块的这个肥猪肉，并被命名为“东坡肉”，得到了广大食众的喜爱。东坡肉也随着苏东坡这样一个名人传播于世。苏东坡 ，a famous poet of the Song Dynasty, invented slow fire braised fatty pork cubes. The dish was named 东坡肉 and garnered Widespread acclaim, Su Dongpo's celebrity status helped to popularize the Dongpo dish. Chinese people promote and use pork time should start from the Ming Dynasty. It was probably during the Ming Dynasty, from the 14th to 17th century, that pork became widely consumed in China. Because at that time, Chinese population was increasing. 适用于养牛、养养羊的草场的逐渐减少，而耕牛又是农业生产的重要工具，无法满足人们的肉食需要。而其他动物里，只有猪是肉多而且好饲养的。During that era, China's population increased substantially, leaving less pasture for raising sheep. Cattle became an important tool for agricultural production and were thus unavailable as a source of food to meet the needs of the people. Compared to other animals. Pigs were easy to rear and with more meat yield. 呃，更为重要的是呢，从元代时期开始，呃，蒙古人传过来的阉割技术得到了普及和推广。从小就阉割的猪，宰杀后不再有浓重的骚味，所以明代以后，猪肉就成为中国人的主要肉食。However, what really popularized the acceptance of pork in the Chinese diet? Has to be the Mongolian technique of castration that was introduced during the Yuan Dynasty from the 13th to 14th century. With castration at an early age, male pigs no longer exhibited boar taint, and pork meat became widely accepted as a staple from the following Ming Dynasty onwards. Chinese people are the main consumers of pork, and the main meat is the meat of the pigs. In Chinese food, the meat is the most important part of the Chinese food. The Chinese people are mainly of the Han nationality, and the meat of the Han nationality is mainly pork. Pork plays a very important role in China's mainstream cuisine. 呃，在中国广为人知的红红烧肉、东坡肘子、回锅肉、梅菜扣肉、呃，画皮烤乳猪等等，以猪肉为为主料的食菜品，可可谓是五花八门。There are all kinds of pork dishes, such as braised pork with soy. Dong Po pork knuckle, twice cooked pork, mustard braised pork, and pork roast, and so, pork roast, and so on. 呃，不但如此，猪的内脏、大肠、肝、肺、蹄、头、耳等，也经常常常是通过厨师的精细烹饪，变为餐桌上的佳肴。Besides the meat, offal such as stomach. Large intestine, liver, lungs, and more can become delicacies through the use of sophisticated cooking techniques. 可以说，在中国人说吃肉的时候，就是吃猪肉。虽然近年来这个国人的饮食结构有所变化，但是猪肉作为主要的肉食地位仍然不可动摇。It can be said that in China, to eat meat is to eat pork. Although in recent years the diet of Chinese people is changing. Pork still retains its status as the main meat. 呃，我要跟大家分享的第五个方面的问题是，在中国猪肉食材中，哪个部位是最受欢迎的 ？And fifth, I would like to talk about which pork cuts are the most popular in China. 在中国不同的地域、不同的民族，对于猪肉食材各个部位的需求不尽相同。Different regions of China and different ethnic groups have different preferences for the pork cuts. 但相对最受欢迎的、最广泛使用的部位，主要有里脊肉、五花肉、梅花肉、猪颈肉
、后腿肉、前腿肉、猪蹄膀、猪排等部位。However, the most popularly and widely used cuts are loin, belly, collar, neck, hind leg, front leg, trotters, and ribs. 我要跟大家分享的第六个问题是：中国的厨师购买猪肉产品时会注意哪个方面的问题 ？And so the sixth topic is, what do Chinese chefs look for when they buy pork? 中国的厨师在购买猪肉的时候，必须首先索取动物防疫监督机构出具的动物产品检疫合格证明和生猪定点屠宰场出具的。肉品品质检验合格证明，这个两个证书。When Chinese chefs buy pork, they first request two certificates: the Animal Products Quarantine Certificate, which is issued by the Animal Epidemic Prevention Agency, and the Meat Quality Inspection Certificate, which is issued by the Live Pig Designated Slaughter Plants. 那然后呢，要看猪猪肉是否是新鲜的猪肉。如果是冰冻的猪肉，要检查它的储藏时间是不能太久。Next, to ascertain if the pork is fresh. For frozen pork, a chef will check to ensure that the storage time has not been too long. 那么新鲜的猪肉呢？表面要求有光泽，用手摸新鲜的猪肉不粘手，感觉稍微有点干，有时也略显湿润。新鲜的猪肉有弹性，用手按压会出现凹痕，但在手松后，凹痕会很快恢复正常。The surface of fresh pork. Has a gloss. Using the hand to feel, fresh pork should not feel sticky and should feel slightly dry, and not too moist. Fresh pork feels kind of elastic with a bounce, such that after you press it down with your fingers and then release the pork, the dented part should bounce back and return to normal. 那厨师们还会用鼻子来闻，闻到一股猪肉特有的香味，还会根据自己的需要选择肥肉。和瘦肉，还要注意不要买到母猪肉，因为母猪肉的皮厚肉老，不容易煮烂。If you use your nose to smell, then there should be a nice smell that is unique to pork. And thereafter, the selection of pork will be based on the preference for either fatty or lean pork. Special attention is made to ensure that sows are not purchased, as the skin of the sow is thick and not easy to cook. 那要跟大家分享第七个问题是中国最受欢迎的猪的品种。Next, I'll talk about China's most popular breeds of pigs. 在中国，猪的品种很多，一般可分为瘦肉型、脂肪型和兼用型三种类型。There are many breeds in China, and they can be categorized as lean meat types, fattier types, and combination types. 中国最受欢迎的是瘦肉型的品种。当前，规模化的 China prefers lean meat type. Currently, large-scale farms use mostly crossbreed large white Landrace, Duroc, Hampshire, and other other breeds. 那规模化的养殖呢？呃，有大白猪、长白猪、杜洛克、皮特兰、汉普特等。外国猪种的杂交品种在系列生产。And those breeds I just mentioned are the most popular used in large-scale Chinese farms. 呃，但中国同样有许多优秀的地方品种，并被人们称之为“土猪”的猪资源受到人们的欢迎。But our country also has many excellent local breeds, and these are called local pigs, and these are very popular in China. 那中国地方猪种可分为华北。华南、华中、江海、西南、中国小型猪等六大类型，代表的品种主要有华北品种、华南品种、华中品种、江海品种、西南品种、中国小型猪种。The breeds can generally be classified into six varieties: the Northern Chinese in Southern China and the Central China, Zhaohai region, Southwest China, and the China small pigs. These are 近几年 ，the northern China variety， 啊、oh, ，sorry，the southern Chinese variety，central Chinese varieties， 
These are the Zhanghai breeds. Here are some southwest varieties. And these pigs are known as the small breeds. In recent years, due to the development of economic and trade relations between China and foreign countries, high quality pork and pork products from Holland, Italy, Spain, Greece, and other countries have continued to enter the Chinese market. 中国的部分养猪肉养殖者的黑毛猪等特色品种，猪肉也在食材上有一定份额。这些猪肉食材由于品种不同、养殖周期长、饲料成分不同，而在品质和口味上优于市场上的普通猪肉，而受到消费者的
提出意见和建议，使澳洲猪肉在初级加工就考虑到中国市场的需求与适应，更好地为中国消费市场提供服务。The sixth thing is to invite Chinese cuisine experts to make feedback and raise suggestions on Australian pork to China, so that Chinese needs are considered right from the beginning of processing in Australia to provide better service for Chinese customers. 第七呢是组织、编辑、出版澳洲猪肉菜创新菜品的专业书籍，推广澳洲猪肉美食，同时指导中国餐饮企业和厨师学习借鉴，为自己的菜谱开发澳洲猪肉菜品。Seventh, we can organize and publish a book on Australian new and innovative pork dishes. We can promote Australian pork gourmet culture. And also provide guidance to Chinese food and beverage enterprises and chefs around how to develop their own Australian pork dishes. 第八呢是组织中国餐饮烹饪专家对澳洲猪肉在中国市场的推广，以及中国烹饪中的使用进行记录、调研、撰写调研报告，提供给澳洲猪肉协会，指导澳洲猪肉在中国市场的开发与应用。Eighth. We can organise China cuisine experts to promote Australian pork in China and record their experiences of cooking with Australian pork. Then to research and prepare a report for APL providing guidance on the development and usage of Australian pork in China. 那最后呢，我想借此机会，祝各位来宾的生意兴隆，事业发达，预祝澳洲猪肉进入中国市场获得成功。Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to wish all present here today a prosperous business, and I hope to see Australian pork successfully gain market access into China. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. So with the younger, a lot of younger Chinese, Jeff, travelling overseas to study, when they come back to China, are they more likely to eat more varied cuisines and less traditional Chinese food? This question is that because many Chinese students are studying in Australia, when they come back, after studying in Australia for a long time, do they have any changes in their diet or changes in their diet? 呃，他们是不是更喜欢吃这个西餐？呃，没有，只是说他们在澳洲实习的时候呢，可能会对西餐呃有有了认识，口味上能够接受了。而回到中国以后，他们仍然是会更喜欢他们从小就在吃的中餐。Okay,、uh, actually, uh, really, you know. Because they grew up in China, so even though they stay several years in Australia, but it's very hard for them to change their eating habit. So when they come back to China, they still love Chinese food. But at the same time, because they have spent some time in Australia, so they can accept Western food very easily. 嗯，特别是澳大利亚的西餐呢，在这个西餐的这个领域里头，并不是非常发达和口味多样的。呃，能够提供给消费者的口味，呃，比中国中餐的口味，呃，品种更少，所以呢，呃，大家呃，只是接受而已啊。And because for the Western food, like, uh, uh, you know, French cuisine, also you can find in Australia and some other American cuisine. Uh, you know, it's a very diversified culture in Australia, and uh, local Australian flavors, tastes, uh, there are some kinds. But as not as as、uh, not as many as Chinese food, so they have、uh, the Chinese students when they come back to China, they will have more choices of Chinese food, of course, uh, uh, so they still eat more Chinese food. Uh, 仅就猪肉的烹饪方法，中国有一百多种，而澳洲呢，可能没有那么复杂的烹饪方法啊。呃 ，In China, for cooking pork, there are more than one hundred cooking ways. But、uh, you know, in Australia, not so many ways, so the students will have more choices in China. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, yeah, Deb Kerr, Australian Pork Limited, as well. I'm going to focus a similar question to Pete, but 
I was wondering the impact of particularly the fast food restaurant trade on your traditional, um, you know, restaurant trade, and particularly as though those are likely to be more Western orientated. You know, I'm thinking McDonald's and all of those type restaurants. So, what impact has that had on your traditional restaurant trade in in China? Uh, 呃，注意到咱们这个演讲里边提到中国快餐，呃，快餐呢有中国快餐，也有一些洋快餐在中国，呃，比如说麦当劳啊、肯德基啊这些，就这些呃洋快餐在中国发展很快，他们对中国的这个餐饮市场人的口味产生了什么影响？嗯，是的，呃，洋快餐呢作为中国快餐的一个品种，呃，这些年在中国得到了很大的发展，呃，特别是中国的快餐的概念，实际上是由洋快餐带来的。到目前为止，中国快餐的这个产业在中国整个的餐饮产业中占到百分之三十以上，很大的份额。嗯 ，Yeah, actually, the uh, some fast food, uh, Western fast food develop develop very fast in China, uh, as you mentioned, the McDonald's, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and uh, actually the Chinese fast food restaurants they learn a lot to develop. Uh, originally. The conception comes from Western countries, and Chinese people adopt this conception to develop its own fast food. And now, the Western cuisine, uh, uh, Western uh, fast food in China, the market uh, uh, it uh, occupies about 30 percent of the total market. Yeah. And this, I, 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 and uh, Western fast food has uh, improved Chinese people's uh, knowledge uh, or uh, let them know more about the Western cuisine. Uh, 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 and the uh, Western fast food, uh, the, development, the development of Western fast food in China has uh, uh, taught the Chinese people some conceptions like uh, industrial production, like uh, you, the usage of uh, a cheese and some special frying method, like uh, uh, some special culinary method, like frying, uh, Western style fry, frying. And it really in enriches, it has enriched the Chinese uh, catering market. Any question? Please. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you for the presentation. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.